I'm so sorry. Now, the intermolecular forces, those are the forces that are inter -bet er, between the molecules that are holding them together in that crystal structure. So they're locking, them, they're locking themselves into that particular structure. So imagine that you guys are, let's say that there's ribbon tied in between you. That's going to kind of keep you in the exact formation that you're in right now. Okay, so that means that when the bell rings and you have to go leave and walk to your next class, you've got to stay in that particular position that you're in. That's what a solid is doing. Is it's got those intermolecular forces that now are locking them into that crystal structure. So if you are doing a phase change right here, what you're doing is you have to now break those some of those intermolecular forces that are holding it together in that structure. That takes a lot of energy. So if you guys are tied together in your ribbon between each of you that kind of holds you into your current seating arrangement, if the bell rings and you want to be able to break that arrangement and you want to be able to flow out of the room and go wherever you're going to go, what would you have to do? Like I'd have to come around and cut with the scissors that ribbon that's in between you, right? Mm -hmm. That process right there of breaking those intermolecular forces, that takes energy. That requires energy. So when the heat energy is still, usually right here, if we're within a, a certain state of matter, well, when you put in energy, it raises the temperature. But if you have to do that process of cutting the ribbons in between, that's going to require heat energy. So now the heat energy is still going in, but rather than going in and raising the temperature, you have to go in and break those intermolecular forces. You actually have to do the phase change. You have to break the parts that are holding it together as a solid so that those molecules can kind of flow past each other as they behave when they're a liquid. Does that make sense? Okay, so then once you've done that process, that phase change has occurred, well, we're still, we're still adding heat energy. And once we're in now a state of matter, once we're in a liquid, as you add heat energy to the liquid, what's gonna happen to its temperature? It's gonna increase. So if you, take, if you get a beaker and you fill it with water from the sink, it might start out at 22 degrees Celsius. Put it on the hot plate as you're adding heat energy to it. You got your thermometer in there. What's happening to the temperature? It's heating up. It, you can see the temperature rise. So at, when we're in a particular state of matter, when the, you add more heat energy, the temperature goes up. But when we reach again that, that next phase change, so if this was liquid water, it would be at 100 degrees Celsius. You've reached a phase change. Again, now we have intermolecular forces that we need to break. We need to rearrange the way that those, that those molecules are, are oriented to each other, the way that they're gonna move relative to each other. And we have to turn from a liquid into a gas. That takes a lot of energy to do that process, to do that phase change. So that is going to, then again, even though you're adding heat energy, your temperature is not going to be rising as, your temperature isn't gonna be rising, it's gonna plateau, it's gonna level off. Once we finish that process, well now we're in a new state of matter, within that state of matter, as we add heat energy, temperature goes up, 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 up. Um, look on the board right behind me. So the way I have it drawn on here is that it's all kind of like even like that. If we are looking at any particular substance, these different spaces here are going to be bigger or smaller depending on what that substance is and how much energy it takes to do those different parts. How much energy it takes to raise the temperature from whatever the, the melting point is to whatever the boiling point is. Um, how much energy it takes to actually do this phase change. How much energy it takes to actually do this phase change. For water, it takes energy to raise temperature of a solid. It takes a certain amount of energy to melt ice, solid water. It takes a certain amount of energy to go from zero degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius. And then it takes a ton of energy to boil water. So when we're talking about water specifically, it takes a ton of energy to turn it from a liquid to a gas. If you are, if it's hot in the summertime and you're sweating, so you've got sweat on your skin, if a breeze then blows by, what happens to that sweat? If you've got sweat sitting on your skin, what's going to happen to that sweat eventually? Like, what's the purpose of sweating? What's going to happen to this? Is it going to stay? Okay. No, let's do this first. If you've got sweat sitting on your skin, in what state of matter is that sweat? Liquid. It's a liquid, right? What's going to eventually happen to that liquid? It's going to evaporate, 
and it's going to turn from a liquid to a gas. If it takes water a ton of energy to turn from a liquid to a gas, it takes water a ton of energy to turn from a liquid to a gas, and that water is sitting, liquid water is sitting on your skin, and it's going to take a lot of energy to turn it into a gas when it evaporates off your skin, where is that energy going to come from? So you've got liquid water on your skin. That liquid water is going to evaporate. Imagine if a breeze blows by, that's going to help it happen faster. But where does the energy come from to turn that liquid into a gas? Where is the water sitting? On your skin. So where is the energy going to come from? From you, from your body. So why does it feel cool when, when you sweat and then that sweat evaporates? Because it's actually taking heat energy away from your body. That process is called evaporative cooling. And that's like a really neat thing. Or it's a cool thing. Get it? That, that. Okay. So that liquid water that's on your skin, it's going to evaporate. And when it evaporates, it takes a ton of energy to do that. And we see that on our phase change. It's kind of spread out like that. Um, so I'm going to draw it on here so we can see it on there since this isn't on the board. So we've got a relatively short plateau for solid to a um, liquid, and then liquid increases, and then we've got a big plateau here to go from a liquid to a gas because it takes a ton of energy. If we're talking about water specifically, it takes a ton of energy to vaporize, a, to, to vaporize water and turn it from a liquid to a gas. So when that water is on your skin and it vaporizes on your skin, it's taking that energy away from your body. So it's actually taking thermal energy away from your body when that happens, which is pretty cool. That's why, like, if, it's, if you know, uh, I think we have air conditioning in here now, but if you're in a school that doesn't have air conditioning, and like at the beginning of the year or the end of the year when it gets really, really hot, and you're sitting there and you're stuck in a classroom that's boiling hot, take paper towels, get them wet, lay them over your arms. Well, that's going to do the same thing. As that wet paper towel, as the water in there evaporates, well, it's going to take energy to do that. Some of that energy is going to come from your arms, so it's going to feel cool. So let's look at the questions on here then. What happens to the temperature of a substance in a constant state of matter? So like we're just talking about a liquid. What happens to the temperature of a liquid when you add heat to it? It increases. Okay, so why don't you guys answer that one before I show you my answer so you have a chance to think about it and write it down in your own words. So when you have one state of matter, so like if you just have a liquid and you add heat to it, what happens to the temperature? Well, the temperature is going to increase. If I put my beaker of water on the hot plate and I add heat to it, the temperature is going to increase. But what happens to the temperature of a substance at a phase change when we add heat? So if we're at the melting point or we're at the boiling point and we add heat energy, what's going to happen to the temperature of it? What's at a phase change, if we add heat energy, if we're moving along this way, what's going to happen to the temperature? What's happening to the temperature right here? It's staying the same. Yep. So the temperature doesn't change. So at a phase change, the temperature doesn't change when as we're adding heat. The next one then says why. So why does the temperature plateau? Why does it level out? Why doesn't the temperature change during the phase changes? Where is that? So we're still adding heat energy, but where is that heat energy going? Into that process of the phase change. It's breaking those intermolecular forces. It's breaking those intermolecular forces it's going in, it's taking, it's requiring heat energy to do the phase change.
And there's two definitions at the bottom of your sheet. So heat of fusion and heat of vaporization. So when we talked about this shape right here of that, of this is called a heating curve. When we talked about this shape, um, that we it takes so much energy to do this phase change, the solid to a liquid, it takes so much energy to do this change, the liquid to a gas. How much energy that takes, again, depending on what the substance is, it takes a certain amount of energy to do that. So for liquid water, all right, remember liquid water, it takes 4.18 joules to raise one gram, one degree Celsius. How much energy do you think it takes to take that same gram of water and now boil it, turn it to a gas? Give me a guess. How many joules do you think it takes? If you know that it takes four, about four joules to raise that gram of water one degree Celsius. Now, if we've got it up to boiling point and we want to actually boil it, how much energy is it going to take for that same gram? You think 400? Jaden, what do you think? What's your guess? Pick a number. And kind of compare it to that four. Do you think it's going to be more? If you think it's going to be more, how much more? Do you think, first of all, do you think it's going to take more energy to boil a gram of water than it is to raise the temperature of, of a gram of water, of liquid water? No, how much more? It takes two, uh, let me get this number right. I think it's 200 no, 2,260 joules per gram of water. That's how much it takes to boil. It takes 2,260 joules to boil one gram of water. That's why this plateau right here, that's why this plateau right here, that's why that's so big, is it takes 2,260 joules to boil one single gram of water. That's a lot of energy. That's why evaporative cooling, that's why sweating, that's why it works. Because right? it takes so much energy away from your body when it's turning from a liquid to a gas. Um, heat of, that, that's heat of vaporization right there. It's how much energy it takes to turn it from a liquid to a gas. It's measured in joules per gram because how much energy does it take to vaporize that one gram? Heat of fusion, that's the plateau between solid and liquid. How much energy does it take to melt to go between a solid and a liquid. How many joules does it take per every gram? Okay, um, I've got one video clip to show you and I wanna do that, but we're kinda tight on time so we'll get to what we get to. Oops, I better stop. Okay, this is the FET that we're gonna be using next week um, for states of matter. So right now we've got neon. Um, we can switch out to oxygen if you want just because oxygen is something you're more familiar with. So at this state right now, where, where, what the oxygen looks like right now, what state of matter is that? This, you'll notice it has a definite shape. It's holding its shape. Um, those molecules, they look like they are in their spot relative to other molecules. They're not moving around. They're not, they're not like flowing past each other. But if you'll notice, they are still moving. Even as a solid, they are still moving. That's a misconception that we've been running up against. Even as a solid, there absolutely is still motion. Um, look also, notice at the top there where it says the temperature. See that temperature scale? And then see where it says 27K? That K is for Kelvin. I could switch it to Celsius, but I'm going to leave it at Kelvin because remember what zero Kelvin means? Zero Kelvin is absolute zero. So that's that theoretical point at which there's no thermal energy, there's no kinetic energy, there's no motion whatsoever. So if I were to make this colder, so I'm going to drag it down, I'm going to make it colder. Watch what happens to the motion of the molecules. Are they still moving? We're at 4 Kelvin. They're still moving. They're vibrating in their position, but there's still motion there. Not sure if we can make it any colder. 3, 2, so we're at 1 Kelvin now. There's still motion, just not a lot. There's a little bit of vibration within their position. So when it's a solid like this, they are locked in that crystal structure. They're locked in their position. There's vibration within their position. They have a definite shape, whatever shape it is right now. It's maintaining that shape. Those molecules relative to each other are all kind of stuck in their position. If I start heating it up, watch how those molecules are moving faster. It looks like there's still a solid so far. Um, let's see what the 
like melting point of oxygen. Melting point of oxygen is uh, negative 218 Celsius, which is what? Roughly 50 degrees Kelvin. So after we get to about 50 Kelvin is when we should see it turn from a solid to a liquid. At that point, I want you to pay attention to what's happening to those molecules. So right now, it's still a solid. There's a lot more motion because it's warmer. It has more higher temperature as a solid, but they're still locked within that position. So once we see them turn into a liquid, so let's heat it up a little bit. As they turn into a liquid, there we go. We're above that melting point now. So they're turning in, it's melting, it's turning into a liquid. See how now those individual molecules, how they're moving relative to each other? They're no longer locked into that position. They can kind of move around, slide past each other, flow around each other. If we then continue to heat it up, at some point we're going to hit the boiling point and it's going to turn from a liquid into a gas. And we've got a few of those oxygen molecules now that are kind of escaping, escaping that, that position as a liquid and they're turning into a gas. Now as a gas, they're zooming all around. If we get them hotter, they should move faster. If we get them hotter, they should move faster. If we get them hotter, they should move faster because they're gaining more thermal energy, gaining more kinetic energy. We're still below room temperature. Room temperature is about 300 Kelvin. Watch how they're moving around. Okay, so now we're about room temperature. And at room temperature, oxygen is a gas. You've got oxygen around you right now, so oxygen is a gas at room temperature. That's what those oxygen molecules that are around you right now, that's what they're behaving like. Zooming all over, running to each other, running into the walls. Um, I like to think of molecules. The analogy that I run all the way through, both in this unit and then especially once we start getting to um, to gas laws, molecules are like kindergartners. So think about how kindergartners behave. Kindergartners, they run around like wild people. Uh, this is an analogy, so we're going to keep it like just as theoretical analogy because analogy, we don't want to run into like ethical issues when we put kindergartners in closets and move them into small spaces and stuff. So we're just pretending, thinking of molecules as kindergartners or as little kids. Um, they're also going to be blindfolded little kids because molecules aren't looking where they're going. So if we've got a room full of kindergartners. Well, how are they behaving? What are they doing? Well, kindergartners run around like wild people. And especially if they're blindfolded, they're going to be running around. They're going to be bumping into each other. They're going to be bumping into the walls. Um, if they have more energy, so how can we give kindergartners more energy? What if we give them a snack? Um, what about after lunch? So after they have lunch, they go out and they have recess. Well, why? Because they're wild. They just got more energy. So if we add more energy, so let's add more energy, they're going to move faster. That's why we send them out to the playground so they can run around like wild people or like molecules out on the playground. Um, what if you move them to a different space? How is that going to affect it? Well, if we change the amount of space they have, what if we put them in the classroom instead? Well, do they move, they, do they bump into each other more often? Do they bump into the walls more often? Because they're still moving around in a smaller space. So our molecules are like kindergartners. Um, we can cool it down. If we cool it down, we should see them slow down. I wonder if I can cool it down any faster. Oh, not like that. As we cool it down, we see them move slower, slower, slower. Eventually, we're going to be able to condense them, turn them back into a liquid. Then we're going to be able to freeze them, turn them back into a solid, and we'll see them again maintain the, the way that they're moving relative to each other. When they go into a liquid, they're going to kind of move, like be sliding, flowing past each other. When they freeze into a solid, they're going to be locked into that structure where each one is sitting next to another one.